Sonny, wake up! There's a new what happened about a Sonic game! Again! Hello and welcome to the video series you just clicked on because you saw this mischievous blue ball of childhood nostalgia, youthful attitude, frustration, and untapped potential in the thumbnail. And speaking of which, nothing says wasted potential more than Sonic the Hedgehog's short-lived, almost non-existent career on the Saturn. If you've ever wondered why the blue blur never had a mainline entry on Sega's beguiled 32-bit machine, well, who oh boy, how do I have an episode for you. While I had assumed 06 or Boom were deadass the worst examples of Sonic's troubled developmental history, it turned out that neither can compare to the sloppy hot mess that was Sonic Extreme. So what happened? The two-tastic rodent was... Wait, is he a rodent? Erinacida? I ain't saying that. The rodent was what moved Genesis's and or Mega Drives to millions of homes across the globe, so obviously Sega was keen to continue that success. Starting with Sonic 2, however, development on hedgehog-focused titles have been within the tension-filled walls of California's Sega Technical Institute, which was founded by Mark Cerny, best known as the mastermind behind the internet meme, Knack. Now, even though Sonic 2 is the best Sonic and no, I won't be taking questions, the development of that game didn't go flawlessly, as it was co-developed by both Sega of America and Japan. There was a significant amount of disagreement and miscommunication between both sides, but hey, at the end of the day, they wound up making Sonic 2. This trend continued with Sonic 3 and Knuckles, albeit a bit smoother, but after that, the Hedgehog's video game career started to divert slightly, and when I say divert, I mean go straight off the map. Development on a follow-up started immediately after Knuckles shipped, and for lack of a better term, let's just call the game in this early phase Sonic the Hedgehog 4, but not that 4. Oh god, I'm gonna have to talk about that one too. Sega of America was put into the driver's seat at the outset, as Yuji Naka and most of the original Sonic team started working on Knights for the Saturn instead. Therefore, Sega of America was delegated to supporting the Genesis way past its prime, so this was meant to be the last big swan song for the console. And since they had already cut their teeth on several 2D Sonic games by that point, the thought here was that they'd be able to bust out one more relatively quickly, and to max out the Genesis while doing it. Unfortunately, a red flag was raised to about half-mast when it came to the story. Sonic 4's original plot was to center around the Bubowskis, a daughter-father duo who were charged with keeping the six magical rings of order safe for uh, reasons, I guess. Robotnik wanted these rings for other reasons, so Tiara and Gazebo tasked Sonic with saving the day. As you can imagine, this idea was scrapped quicker than a whippet with a bum full of Sonic. The plot and setting then changed to center around Robotnik's newest death egg. A death egg so big that not even he himself could eat it. I mean, so big that it dwarfed Sonic's planet, Mobius. Yes, Mobius. The team had decided to adapt the then-current Saturday morning cartoon show, which would have squeezed in the Freedom Fighters, Sally No Pants Acorn included. During all of this, word came down from on high that there was going to be a sudden change in the machine they were targeting. Get used to this now. STI were ordered to abandon the Genesis altogether and to move everything over to the 32X, which was gonna need all the help it could get. Work on this version of the game did not last long, since the 32X burned so brightly and yet so briefly. Well, it didn't actually burn brightly, but I... Uh, Sega abandoned the tumor-shaped add-on after only six months on the market, you see, so they felt that releasing a new exclusive mainline Sonic on it would have been a waste of resources. That meant there was only one machine or planet left to develop for, and that of course would be the Saturn. Now, while you may think that having your project bumped up to your company's newest, most high-spec platform was a good thing, well, you'd be wrong. 
Very few members of STI had any experience with 3D hardware or programming, and this was going to be their first non-16-bit game. It's unclear if Sonic, whatever it was called at this point, had a flirtation with staying 2D on the Saturn, but if it did, it was probably short-lived. With the launch of the Nintendo 64 coming in about a year, the sneak peeks of Mario, and the smash success that the PlayStation was already seen, Sega decided Sonic needed to burst into the third dimension to compete, even if no one on the actual development team knew how to do such a thing. How much time would Sega give to SDI to accomplish this then? Holiday season 1996 is the official answer, but the real answer is not enough. While part of the plan was to hopefully steal some thunder from these guys, the holiday mandate wasn't just about that though, as it was also about a key marketing decision. Marketing for what? The live action movie you never even knew existed! Sega had cut a preliminary deal with MGM Studios, and the game was going to link up to this film, so it had to come out in late 1996, hell or high water. You out there watching this right now, grip the sides of your monitor, TV, or phone, hold it tight, and just lick it. This is 100% grade A Kobe beef what happened material here, folks. Now, as I alluded to before, Sega of America were very late to the Saturn game as their job was to support the Genesis and add-ons until their dying breath. So when STI got the order to move to the Saturn, Sega of America didn't have any dev kits or even specs for the machine. That's just how frosty the relationship between both sides of Sega really was, and not just when it came to Sonic. If you want to find out how this affected fighting games within the company, check out this Flophouse files right here. When STI did finally get the dev kits, they knew they were gonna go through it. Creating a 3D game with little experience and even less time was going to be a Herculean task, so they decided to branch off into two main groups. One focused on creating 3D boss encounters that would give Sonic a lot of free movement and would be achieved through the Saturn's raw polygon pushing power. They had very few tools or an engine to work off of, so this had to be done from scratch, and therefore was mostly trial and error. The other team started putting together the main zones leading to said boss encounters, but did so through Windows PC development tools, because otherwise they would have to share the dev kit afforded to them from Sega of Japan, which would have meant even slower progress. The idea was that they would develop on PC and then port down to Saturn specs when they had finalized work. Also, it's been reported that during this phase of development, Yuji Naka paid a visit to STI to see how things were going, and once he saw how said things were going, he simply said, good luck. Disagreements between Sega of Japan and America began to get more and more frequent, leading to arguments between design and programming, and this is a chief reason why the game was making such slow progress at this critical point. The critical point in question was late 95, early 96, and already the Saturn wasn't seeing the momentum enjoyed by its competitors, so the stakes grew increasingly higher. The project, now dubbed Sonic Extreme, found itself in the middle of a war between two sides, with neither able to agree on a consistent direction. This resulted in the game's team lead, Michael Kosaka, leaving the company altogether, and Chris Sen, a relative newcomer, was then put in his place. This was not an enviable position, mind you, especially for someone with little leadership experience. And to top it all off, as we've seen, Chris was inheriting a mess. Producer for the project, Mike Wallace, in an interview a few years ago, revealed that the internal politics heavily affected the game and stifled things from just about every angle. We had artists doing art for levels that hadn't been concepted out. We had programmers waiting and waiting and waiting until every minute detail had been concepted out. And we had designers doing whatever the hell they wanted. It was a mess, and because of the internal politics, the art director had trained his art team to hate the designers and programmers, it was even more difficult to get any work done. 
During this extremely disorganized phase of the project, multiple game designs were still being considered. At one point, it was going to feature four playable characters with distinct gameplay styles, with Sonic having to navigate levels with the fisheye lens perspective many of you have probably seen and thrown up to while watching. Things are about to get bulbous. Ah! Since they were really running out of time though, it was decided that they should just focus on Sonic and his new gameplay style. Points for originality, but personally I always thought this looked like a quick insert or a graphical effect for a 90s as shit Sonic commercial and not like a full-fledged title. Imagine playing a game through a telescope or a door's peephole for minutes or hours at a time. I mean, I guess that's extreme? Mr. Miles Prower was going to have first-person flight mode gameplay, while Knuckles would indulge in top-down sections, during which I'm sure he would never utter a chuckle. Uh, now, I did say four characters, didn't I? Well, both Amy and uh, Tiara B Buberella, or whatever her name was, well, they were briefly considered, and if this plan had gone through, they would have jumped and or bopped through traditional side-scrolling levels. Speaking of those levels, the Windows-based programming method that they had been built under proved to be kind of disastrous, try to sound shocked. When they attempted to port their work over to the underpowered Saturn, it was so headache-inducing and such a time sink that the team contracted an outside party point of view to do that work for them. Otherwise, they'd never get anything done. Adding a third team into the mix who were off-site in these almost non-existent days of online communication just added to the chaos. Or chaotics! Eh, I tried. Look, I'm trying to add some levity here, people. Things kept spiraling. Point of view started making their own unique builds and stopped taking direction, which resulted in clashes between all three teams, with some employees even going like maverick and shit. And that was the perfect time for another visit from Sega of Japan higher-ups. And as you should be used to it by now, this only made things worse. One look at what had been done, and they were ordered to scrap almost everything and to rebuild using the 3D boss encounter engine as a base. All that Windows development work for the main zones was completely thrown out. Now, thankfully, since they were told to start over and scrap a bunch of work, Sega of Japan then pushed the game's release date back by around six months. Which is something I would be saying to you if this wasn't mid-90s Sega. The movie was still in the cards, you see, and the Saturn was still lacking a big holiday title, so the release date stayed the same. Get cracking, fellas! The team at STI crunched for months leading up to release, with Michael Wallace detailing just how committed the team was to making that date, saying that an employee actually left their apartment, cancelling their lease, moved all their belongings into the office, and worked day and night. Sega of America president Bernie Stoller knew Extreme was going poorly and that the team were being pushed to their limits, so he asked them straight up what could he do to directly help the project. Mike Wallace said that getting the engine and tools from Sonic Team's Knights, which they had seen an early version of months prior, would be a godsend, and Bernie Stoller delivered. The team started experimenting, but it was only two weeks later when Bernie came back and said they had to immediately stop. This was at the behest of Yuji Naka, who threatened to leave Sega if the engine continued to be used. Chris Sen revealed his thoughts on this in an interview with Retro Gamer. Personally, I can understand Naka's interest in keeping technology his team developed under tight control. Sonic was a franchise he clearly felt should be handled solely by Sonic Team. He must have felt very strongly about it if he was willing to threaten to quit. I mean, sure, if he was willing to sabotage Sonic's Saturn debut in a bid to make sure his team would remain at the top of the hill, yeah, I would call that pretty strongly. 
While that was certainly devastating to the project's chances, all this stress wound up hurting much more than Sega's bottom line. Roughly two months before the deadline, both Christina Coffin and Chris Sen came down with sudden illnesses. Coffin developed a bad bout of pneumonia, which took them out for weeks, whereas Sen had contracted an unspecified illness and was given six months to live, but thankfully recovered afterwards these were people they really couldn't replace. Chris Sen was the game's director, and Coffin was the one responsible for the 3D boss encounter engine. And so, it's with these final two setbacks that Sega finally came to their senses. With Extreme getting cancelled, Sega then quickly attempted to get some type of product out to make up for it. Traveler's Tales Sonic 3D Blast got a quick and dirty port onto the Saturn and was immediately slotted into that holiday 1996 date. They were also contracted to throw together Sonic R the very next year, and stuck to a basic racing design to help get it out the door ASAP. It should be noted that it was actually Sega of Europe that coordinated these projects between Traveler's Tales and Sonic Team, and aside from distribution, Sega of America was cut out completely for reasons I don't think I need to go into. The failure of Sonic Extreme didn't just disband the team, it essentially killed Sega of America in terms of being an active developer. Chris Sen would move on to Luxoflux and the True Crime series, and eventually even wound up back at Sega to work on Sonic Boom. Christina Coffin bounced between several big studios, working on Far Cry, Assassin's Creed, and finally Battlefield. As for Mike Wallace, well, he would also see a successful career working on franchises like Tomb Raider, Army of Two, and most importantly, get on the mic. But wait, you ask, what about that Sonic movie? Well, the plan was for Sonic Extreme to have a cliffhanger ending, which would lead into the events of the film, which was going to be called Sonic the Hedgehog and the Wonders of the World. Rolls right off the tongue. When it was clear that the game wasn't going to make the end of 1996, the movie met a fate more horrible than death. The desire for a big mainline Sonic title to save the Saturn was essentially abandoned here, and Sega had to set its sights on the future. Well, in our heads, 9999 was when the Dreamcast was released that wasn't so in Japan. The console made its debut at the end of 98 in its home country, and so did Sonic Adventure, which means that it was made fairly quickly. While STI were struggling in mid-1996, Sonic Team had just finished Nights and had already begun development on Sonic Adventure, so it only took them two short years to make the Dreamcast's Japanese debut, give or take a month. Boy, uh, all that 3D experience and tools you guys had sure would have helped out the other teams, huh? Alright, let me be clear. A lot of this could have been avoided. Like, almost all of it. While there was pressure to deliver a big 3D game that would wow new fans, the first version of Sonic Extreme the team had started on, the 2D side-scroller, was definitely the safer bet. If STI had been able to incorporate everything we had learned with 2D, uh, but maybe leave Tiara Titikowski out of it, and then put that game on the Saturn, we could have gotten the ultimate 2D Sonic game back in 96. It could have had insane sprite scaling, rotation, color, and maybe even some basic 3D polygonal elements for special stages. Just, it was right there, right in front of them. But as we know, 2020 vision always seems to do its best work when it's in hindsight. Fans have since tried to resurrect or keep interest in Sonic Extreme alive because of course they would. Back in 2015, an early build of it was released to the public. It was incredibly basic, not very good, but nevertheless fascinating. It has to be the most infamous lost slash cancelled Sonic anything that there's ever been. We'll leave on Chris Sen, summing things up about this tumultuous time in his career. 
It was about as bad as I've seen, the politics that led to Kosaka-san's departure. Allowing a newbie wannabe designer like me to fill a veteran like Michael Kosaka's shoes without guidance and direction. Going through three lead programmers in the first year and a half of production, each time restarting the technology. A divide between people's ideas about what the game should be. Egos, inexperience, poor communication, bad politics, all of these things contributed to the inevitable demise of the project. Ugh, that was rough. In recent years, some fans have theorized that Sonic Lost World took some inspiration from Extreme and some elements of its design that with wow, the Sonic Lost World. I I had completely wiped that from my memory. And it, wait, wait, what? There was Zelda DLC in that? If you know of any other canceled games, Sonic related, Sega related, oh wait, there was Yoshi DLC too? Then let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or speed on over to the green hills of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss and nominate what you'd like to see in the future. See you next time and thanks for watching. It's spherical! <laughs> spherical!